I am Anna Seewald, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about growing ourselves while raising our children. I'm a psychologist, educator, and parent coach. And on this podcast, I explore how you can connect to your authentic self, practice radical self-care, and raise emotionally healthy children. Let's break the generational cycle of trauma for a more peaceful, kind, and compassionate world. Today, growing inner resources. I am pleased to welcome to the show a returning guest, Oren J. Sofer. He teaches meditation and communication internationally. Oren holds a degree in comparative religion from Columbia University and is a certified trainer of nonviolent communication and a somatic experiencing practitioner for the healing of trauma. He is also the author of several books, including the bestseller, Say What You Mean, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication, and his latest book, Your Heart Was Made for This, Contemplative Practices to Meet the World in Crisis, with courage, integrity, and love. His teaching has reached people around the world through his online communication courses and guided meditations. In fact, if you use meditation apps, you may recognize Oren's voice as he's a popular teacher on some of those apps. Since the last time we spoke, Oren has become a father And in the beginning of our conversation, I asked him about his experience, and I was really moved by his answer. His new book includes 26 qualities for training your heart, mind, and body to heal inwardly and guide your actions outwardly. In today's conversation, we talked about some of them, such as joy, attention, wonder, compassion, energy, and I hope you will find this conversation nourishing and expansive. And if you listen to the very end, there is a surprise for you and for Oren too. Please enjoy. Oren, welcome to the podcast again. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be here and see you again. I am super excited. When I saw your name, I'm like, yes, I do actually remember our previous conversation. To tell you the truth, I've been podcasting for eight years. Obviously, I don't remember all the interviews, right? But there are some guests or stories or moments that are very memorable. And in your conversation, there are two things that you said that are still with me. Are you ready? (laughs) I am. I I can't wait. And I'm a little nervous. (laughs) No, really powerful things. One of the things was about relationships. You know, it was the time, the conversation we had was when you had your first book. So we were talking about communication and relationships. And you said, you know, sometimes, obviously I'm paraphrasing, sometimes you have to see what's available in the relationship. Like what's available in this relationship for me? And that phrase and whatever you said after that struck me so deeply because oftentimes we get so wrapped up in wanting more and from our parents or partners, but to really truly be honest and say what's available in this relationship. So that was point number one. And the second point was about letting go. And you said it so poetically that letting go happens. We don't have to certain things. I, I can find and play them towards yeah, the yeah. end of this conversation. I have oh, it in, fun. in Google Drive. I can play the audio and we can listen to it together. Since the last time that we spoke, you have written another book. So congratulations. I actually love the title, Your Heart Was Made for This. And in it, you talk about various qualities and practices that we can cultivate those qualities. I chose a few of them and I'm going to ask you some questions, but since you are a relatively new parent and this is a parenting podcast, which ones do you think are useful or applicable or important rather for parents to cultivate? Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) It's hard. I mean, which ones aren't? (laughs) I think they're all essential and which is why it's, I'm so excited about the book and about sharing it. I mean, you know, 
just to touch on a few, like I talk about energy and I talk about rest. If there's anything, my wife and I were, were both older parents. We're both in our forties and we joke sometimes about how having children late in life, we've traded energy for wisdom <laughs> because we have very little energy and hopefully a little bit of wisdom from our, our lived years to, you know, energy and rest, to patience, courage. I, I talk about the courage just to even bring children into the world today and how big a decision it was for me to say yes when my wife came to me a few years ago and said, hey, I think I want to have a baby, you know, after being together for nearly 10 years. Uh, patience is huge, just the capacity to bear with the discomfort in a way that is not reactive, that doesn't shut us down or contract inside. Letting go, you know, I have a chapter on renunciation, which is a kind of provocative word because we associate it with deprivation and asceticism, but it's really about discovering our own richness inside and a sense of fulfillment that comes from relinquishing our preferences. And if there's anything I'm learning from my child, it's how, you know, I'm not in control and, uh, you know, things are going to unfold the way they do. And so there's a lot of letting go in parenting. Other things I think come a lot naturally and are less, are kind of the gifts of parenting, things like joy and wonder. Devotion is an interesting one because, you know, as parents, I think we are kind of biologically <laughs> compelled to be devoted to our children. And yet it's also a quality that we can cultivate with great benefit to really see how when we put our whole heart into loving and serving our families, uh, it gives back so deeply. And how to do that in a way that feels like it has integrity and that it's not like we're compromising ourselves or feeling resentful. So, and forgiveness is a huge one. It's the last chapter in the book because it's a difficult one, but... Um, you know, my wife and I forgive each other every day for our shortcomings. And I think uh, one of the hardest practices of forgiveness, which does not mean turning a blind eye or condoning harm or being passive, it means freeing ourselves from holding on to things that hurt us. Uh, but I think one of the hardest people to forgive are ourselves. And particularly, you know, the difficult lessons we learn as parents, the mistakes we make, how to have compassion and tenderness for ourselves. Yeah. So just <laughs> a range of things. Yeah. A range of things. I want to ask you a little bit, maybe that courage part to have a child. What were your fears or worries? Why can you tell me a little bit about that? It, it courage. I, I do think it's a courageous act. Yeah. But what was your reasoning? Thinking you, where was your heart? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think a lot of people I talked to, or I, a lot of people I spoke to, friends and family at the time, thought that I was afraid of being a bad parent, you know, or making mistakes or failing. And I actually, it was not a concern of mine, not because I think that I'm impeccable in any way, but just because I'm okay with messing up. It's one of the things that my meditation practice has taught me is to really be, to celebrate and learn from our mistakes, if you even believe in that concept anymore, and you know, really embrace the beauty of our imperfections. So that wasn't a concern for me. The concern was twofold. On the personal level, I feared and still fear the depth of pain that we open ourselves to when we choose to love. And I knew that loving a child would be unlike any other love I've known. It's different from loving a parent. It's different from loving a sibling. And it's different from loving a spouse. And my own spiritual practice has taught me that the other side of love is loss. And the other side of joy is grief. And they're inseparable. And so to open my heart so fully to this new being and connection inevitably entails opening my heart to that potential for grief and loss and pain. And so just the intensity, just the sheer intensity of the hurt and the vulnerability is, it's a lot, you know, to take in. So there's that on the personal level. And then on the collective level, I worry about the future of our planet and our society. And as you know, so much is hurting right now and coming apart. The planet is really struggling and 
we're not doing enough as far as I can tell and as many scientists are warning. So I worry just about, you know, what is the world I'm bringing this child into and what will be here for him as he grows and what will he have to face? So those were the concerns. And, you know, it, it was something a friend said to me, the personal pain was really not the stumbling block because it's part of learning and living, right? Which is one of the things I care most about is just living fully and learning the most from being here. But it's something a friend of mine said to me about the challenges we're facing on our planet today and parenting that really made a difference. Is a very good friend of mine. I talk about him in the book, actually. He said, I don't think the world will be better off for you not having a child. I don't think the world will be better off for you not having a child. And I thought he's probably right. You know, this being that my wife and I raise with, you know, all of the work we've done to be aware and kind and loving and have integrity, we're probably going to raise, you know, a pretty good human being who's going to do some good things in the world. No pressure, kid. <laughs> but I really felt like, oh, this can actually be a contribution. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so moved by your sharing and very profound. Yeah, I, I just want to hold that in my heart and not ruin it or comment or anything. Oh, thank you. Well, and I just want to add, you know, just since you invited me into that topic by talking about courage, one of the things that I try to point out in the book is that, you know, one of the great myths about courage is that it means not being afraid. And that that's not how I understand courage. Courage is actually the willingness to move forward and act in spite of fear. So true. And yeah. Actually, I wrote a newsletter maybe this last past year to my subscribers. And I spoke about, I had this epiphany one day. I was walking and I don't know, I had to make a decision or I was faced with something that required courage and I was very scared. And I thought about this topic and I realized that I've never done anything with courage, with its presence, courage comes after you do it scared. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, wow, I did a courageous thing. But I don't think I've ever done anything in my life where I felt courageous to do or to act. And it was this big realization. Wow. It's not like with courage, we do things. Courage is sort of like this after thing. It's a courageous act. We do it scared with fear present. And that in and it's, uh, itself is the courageous act, not the absence of fear. It, it was quite interesting. I wrote it and people responded to it so, you know, I got so much feedback. They said, it's so true, Anna. You are so true. I've shared the same idea. It touched people's hearts. So say more about this. Yeah. I just, I love the way you put that. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the ways I invite people to develop courage in the chapter. I love playing with words too, you know, and courage comes from core, which means heart. Corazón. <laughs> That's right. Right. And Espanol corazón and the Latin root core, uh, you know, it, it takes heart to face the truth, to meet life on its own terms. It takes a lot of heart to act in alignment with our values. And it takes heart to take care of ourselves, really, to know, you know, what's needed for our body, for our mind. It takes heart to look around in our community and respond to the needs that are there. So how do we build courage? I, I invite people in the book to look in precisely the ways you were talking about to say, look back and say, well, where was a place in your life where you recognized that you had courage, where you did feel uncertain, a little scared, not sure, and still you moved forward, you took that step, um, you got through it. And then to recognize and really honor the strength that's there in our heart. And then I think a key thing is to look at the what's the next step? I think there's a way that we can trip ourselves up when we try to stretch too far, demand too much of ourselves, and then either burn out or collapse or freeze. And to just say, what are the things that I'm wanting to accomplish, I'm wanting to contribute to, that I feel uncertain about, that I have some fear, or, you know, that kind of little tremble inside. And where can I stretch? And it's by, you know, walking into that a little bit at a time that we develop more courage and strength. Yeah. I want to ask you about attention. I think as humans, as parents specifically, 
we need attention. It's an important resource in order to be present and parent intentionally. Attention is, is important. And I love how you started the book with attention. That's the number one quality. Because if you don't have attention, how can you be present and live your life, right? You won't be there. Yeah. So let's talk about how we can build attention, or maybe there's a story that you can tell. I know each chapter has beautiful stories in the book. I enjoyed reading them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a phrase that's been with me recently, the last few months. You talk about the role of attention in parenting and in our lives and living well and being able to accomplish anything, really. And that, that phrase is that to love is to pay attention you know, to give someone or something our attention is a kind, it's a form of love. I think about how much my son is teaching me, who's just turning one, about the power of paying attention, how much he's confirming what I already know from my meditation practice, but also deepening it and how how powerful it is and has been since he was a newborn, since he first arrived, to just give him undivided attention and to just see this, uh, this fresh, malleable, open, completely vulnerable consciousness, how important it is to feel that there's someone there seeing him, tending, and how he can get quite upset, you know, when I'm with him, if I'm, say, looking at my phone to do something for a moment, and he feels that disconnection and how unsettling it is for him, not in a kind of self-centered and demanding way, like, you need to pay attention to me, but like, I'm confused. We're both here right now, but I don't know what you're doing and why, and you know, where did you go, that kind of thing. So there's a battle raging for our attention. One of the stories I tell in, in the book is making this connection between the battle that's happening around the world for the right to seeds and heirloom seeds and the forces of agribusiness patenting seed and trying to control farmers' right uh, access to seeds. And I quote the powerful activist and author Vandana Shiva, who says, when you control seed, you control life. And one of the key metaphors that I use in the book is this metaphor of seeds. Henry David Thoreau said, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there and I am conv- and, and I am prepared to expect miracle. So we have seeds in our heart and our mind. We have these potent qualities that are seeds of transformation. We have these potentials for love and compassion and generosity and gratitude. And we also have the potential for anger, for hatred, for violence, for self-centeredness, these different capacities or seeds. And the question is, which seeds are we watering in our consciousness? What are we giving attention to? We're always practicing something. Every day we are shaping our minds and hearts and we are being shaped by the world around us, by the people around us, by our society around us. And so much of what does that shaping is how we use our attention. Where are we placing our attention? What are we giving our attention to outside and inside? And this battle to control our attention has been called the attention economy. And it's this relentless monetization of our attention because one, when you can command someone's attention, you can generate profit through advertising. And two, when you can control attention, you can influence action. So you can actually influence behavior by attracting and retaining our attention through social media, through persuasive design and technology. So to reclaim our attention is a radical act. And one of the reason I start the book with this chapter on attention is because we can actually build our capacity to choose where do we place our attention. And when we do that, we start to see that we have the power to build inner strength. We have the power to nourish our hearts, to be more resourced in life so that we can parent more effectively, love more fully, be more confident, competent, and creative in our work be more engaged and effective in our communities. And it all begins with how we pay attention. Yeah, so true. I I think, but if you don't think of attention as it's an inner resource, as it's 
an inner strength. If you don't pay attention to your attention, you're disposing of it. You dispose it unconsciously. And But I think I also think of it as a valuable resource. I talk about three resources, attention, energy, and time. The moment you phrase it like that, an inner resource, it's a prized, limited resource. And you have the power to give it to things. It's a big shift. It's it's a totally, totally big shift. And you live your life differently. You know, no one, like Johan Harry wrote in his book, The St- Stolen Focus. I'm not sure if you read that book or you had time, you had a baby. Last year, that book came out. Stolen Focus, it's stolen from us, right? And the words that you're even using, we need to reclaim our attention. It's kind of a sad thing that, we have to reclaim it. I love the watering of the seeds metaphor. It's like that story, that fable or whatever it's called, the one you feed, right? There's two wolves. I don't know if it's a Buddhist teaching or... Uh... It's. Uh, I've heard that it's a Cherokee legend. I checked it out with a colleague who's First Nation and she said she asked a Cherokee elder and they said, we'll take credit for it. But yeah, the, the story goes that there's this grandfather talking to his or grandparent talking to their grandchild and it says, you know, there's this battle raging in my heart. There are these two wolves and one is anger and hatred and violence and jealousy and self-centeredness and the other one is love and, and kindness and generosity and patience and courage. And the grandchild looks up at the grandparent and says, which one wins? And the grandparent says, the one I feed. And so there's that sense of we feed these different energies, what I call qualities in our hearts and minds with our attention. What do we give attention to? And so the cultivation of attention, the reclaiming of attention is both an external and an internal practice. So externally, you know, we look at what are we spending our time doing? You made that connection between energy, attention, energy, and time, right? These resources we have. Time is the one that we can't get back. <laughs> energy energy, and attention are renewable resources in my view, but time only goes in one direction. So what are we doing with our time and our attention? How are we spending our time? So we, we begin to track What activities are we engaging in? Who are we spending time with? And are there ways that we can begin to renew ourselves that are healthier, you know, without, say, reaching for a screen every time we feel a little bit uncomfortable or have a moment? So finding ways to renew ourselves that nourish us, like spending time with friends, being in nature, art or music, exercise, poetry, dance, you know, documentaries, learning, reading, all of these wonderful ways we have of engaging our attention that nourish and feed us. But then internally, we also need to look at how are we using our attention. So where does my attention go every day? Am I ruminating on the things that distress me? Am I focusing always on what's wrong and what I don't like, kind of feeding this biological negativity bias? Am I dwelling on the aspects of my personality that I don't like? Am I torturing myself by focusing on things I can't control? and feeling worried and helpless? Or am I giving my attention to what's beautiful and supportive and nourishing? You know, am I noticing the goodness in myself and those around me? Uh, Am I attending to impulses towards generosity or gratitude or kindness? Am I noticing the places where I'm hurting or lonely or grieving and making space for that? So we, one of the fundamental kind of insights that accompanies any kind of contemplative practice or healing modality is the understanding that we can actually choose where we place our attention, that it's not random and it doesn't need to be dictated by habit or by the market. And we see this every day in really simple ways when, you know, like, one of the examples I like to use is to invite people to say, look around and <laughs> notice something visual, a tree, a painting, anything you see, folks listening can do this right now. And then to notice what you hear, a pause of silence on the show, maybe a plane passing or the sound of my voice. So just right there, we changed the channel. We redirected our attention from seeing to hearing. And so we can do that. We can develop that capacity and do it at more and more refined levels. You can choose what to think 
you can choose whether or not to think. <laughs> oh, that's so hard, Oren. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But it takes practice to just recognize, you know, I'm worrying about that conversation I'm going to have with my boss again. And to say, that's not useful right now. I'm going to focus my attention somewhere else, you know, on cooking this meal or enjoying the breeze as I'm taking a walk. Oh, I was having a hard time with this last week. I had to fire a client, this high conflict couple I was working with, and there was a situation anyways, but he had said certain things and he was, my mind kept kept going to it. And I was saying all the good things and I was trying to practice, but it was still so hard. At times it would come to the foreground of my mind, you know, the negative thoughts about him and our conversation. I would redirect my attention. I can choose my thoughts, my thoughts, blah, blah, blah. And I could still feel that it's in the background, but it's still there. I couldn't eliminate. There were times when I was with people talking and engaged in a dialogue or conversation I'm like, wow, when I was with Diana, I didn't even think about this. But when I was on my own, I felt like I was toggling between foreground, background. It took me several days. It's not that easy to practice that. No, and, and it's an art. And, and I think you're pointing to something very important there. As, as you said, it's not about eliminating the thoughts. It's about choosing our what are we attending to in the foreground and the analogy. And this is about concentration, which is another chapter in the book, the power of a collected mind being able to reclaim our scattered and fragmented attention and have access to all of our inner resources. And so the analogy that I like to use, which I, I got from my colleague Sharon Salzberg, is it's like having a conversation with a friend in a noisy cafe make everyone leave or stop talking to enjoy the conversation with your friend. You just need to let it be in the background. And so when there's something like this that's really troubling, one of the ways I think to strengthen our capacity to choose attention is to make sure that we also are giving it airtime, right? Is to know it's like, is this the time and the place to be perseverating about the client and wondering and worrying what I'm going to do. It's like, no, I'm with my friend or, you know, no, I'm cooking dinner or, you know, I'm meditating what, you know, whatever it is that's happening. This is not the time that I want to be engaging with this. And so you gently, as you said, redirect the attention and you keep doing that to strengthen that capacity. But if we don't also say, hey, come on in. Let's sit down and hear what you have to say and really engage with it at some point. Then we end up just creating tension and fighting a war with ourselves and trying to suppress it. So there's that balance of choosing to say not now, and then at other times saying, okay, let's engage with this. Let's see what there is that's here for me. What is the message I need to hear? What are the feelings that are present? What are my needs in relation to this? And then that can inform a wise response and how we act and engage. Oh, thank you for normalizing this experience for me and putting beautiful words. And this is so comforting to hear what you're saying. And I love that description of the noisy cafe. It's so true. You don't have to get rid of people so that you can have a conversation. And I can not agree enough about the airtime. You do need to give airtime as opposed to wanting to eliminate the thought or whatever it is percolating inside us. Yeah, so, so true. And in that, you said something about this, the senses, a few paragraphs before I asked you a question and it like your somatic experiencing background speaks in there. And when you said that, I wanted to comment that, hey, it seems like engaging the senses when you said pay attention to the sound or a tree or something. Yeah, so, so true. There was a story in book, I can't remember under what quality, where your seventh grade teacher ask you to draw the same thing over and over again. Was that in the gratitude story or? I think it's in the chapter on wonder or, <laughs> or curiosity. It's probably curiosity, actually. What I love about the fact that neither of us can remember which chapter it's in is that these qualities, these different potentials that I talk about in the book, they support each other and they flow into each other you know so and it's often the case that they work together you know like to have courage also takes energy and it takes compassion often self compassion so yeah or would you like me to share the share the story or did you have a question about it yeah 
No, I don't have a question about it, but I think it's a really good teaching in there. The story, I think it's an important one. Yeah. Yeah. So the story is about uh, my seventh grade science teacher, Mrs. Cecilia, and it was in the chapter on wonder. And she gave us this assignment to draw uh, a tree branch every other day for, I don't know if it was two weeks or a month, right in the early spring. And so I grew up in New Jersey, uh, where we actually have seasons. We don't really have them here in California. But you know, in the winter, everything dies and goes dormant. And in the spring, it all grows again. So as I explained in the book, you know, I knew, so I chose this uh, maple sapling outside our house. And I knew that deciduous trees lose their leaves and grow them back in the fall. And you know, in the spring, they lose their leaves in the fall and they grow. But I had never actually paid careful attention and tracked it closely enough to see how it happens. And so I started the first couple of days, you know, just drawing this little dead twig, very dutifully being a good student and doing my homework. And then after about a week, the something remarkable happened, which is from the end of this stubby brown little stick began to emerge this tiny bud. And I watched from day to day in amazement as this bud grew and then this delicate translucent leaf, so tender and fine, started to emerge and unfurl from the bud. And it was this incredible lesson in slowing down enough to really see our world and to be so amazed by the gift of being here and just the wonder of how miraculous and complex the world is. And so I talk in the book about how essential wonder is to living a meaningful life, to being fulfilled, to being, to feeling alive and to nourishing action. So much of the natural world is under attack and has been, you know, since the beginning of the industrial revolution and this kind of extractive economy that we live in that just treats the planet as an unlimited resource to profit from. And, you know, we only protect that which we love. And so wonder is a doorway to reverence. And when we feel a connection to a place, to the natural world, we feel that sense of reverence. We make choices based on that. We'll be more courageous. We will be more energized and motivated to act, to protect what we love. Boy, I love that story so much. It reminds me of this I used to live somewhere else four years ago, and there was this beautiful park, and there was this tree. It had this odd shape, and I would take pictures of that tree. I'm a photographer, so I would take pictures in different seasons, the same tree in different seasons. Even in the spring, I would take for years. I've taken pictures of this tree let's say four springs, four winters, four autumns, and compare them the same spot. And it's incredible how each year is different for the spring season. And I was amazed by that tree. So that that reminded me of that. But you're right, we need to slow down to pay attention. We, We have to be here to pay attention to those little wonders so that we can reap the benefits of awe and wonder. Yeah. And it's, you know, just to return to parenting, it's something that I am relearning, you know, from my son and, you know, that this young children kindle in us rekindle that sense of wonder because everything is new. You know, he just turn on a light switch. You just turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it. It's just like, wow, that's amazing. Cause and effect. Look, I press this and this happens. Or, you know, he spent, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes, you know, watching a bee earlier this spring and a flower, you know, how, when was the last time we as adults like actually watched an insect for that long, you know? So it's one of the wonderful gifts, I think, of parenting, particularly young children, and I'm sure there are other gifts as they grow, of getting to see the world anew again and remember and rekindle the wonder for all of the things that we overlook because they've become routine or familiar. Yeah, so true. So true. There's a saying, I can't remember. There's a famous quote, we look at the world once in childhood, the rest is memory or something. I'll I'll find the quote and I'll say it in the introduction. It's a beautiful quote. Yeah. And just to add, to build on that is, you know, 
it's one of the things that drew me to meditation, which is this capacity to see the world with new eyes that meditation helps us to cultivate, as Aldous Huxley said, to cleanse the doors of perception, right? To see beyond the memory. One of the things we say in meditation sometimes, it's kind of similar to the quote you're reaching for is, you know, like when you drink a cup of coffee, say, or eat some delicious food, it's like we're often only present for the first bite or the first, you actually taste the first bite and then you eat the rest in your mind. We're not actually there in the sensory world. We're just there in the idea of it and then thinking about something else or doing something else. So there's so many ways, right, to recultivate that wonder and be fully, fully present to our lives. We look at the world once in childhood, the rest is memory. I think I said it correctly the first time. I want to ask you about gratitude. I marked the book. Let me see why this book. Um, I want to read what I marked, and maybe there's a question there. Sometimes I read the book uh, and I mark certain things and I forget. <laughs> so gratitude and grief may seem to be in tension with one another. Looking more closely, we see that gratitude and loss are inseparable. Awareness of what is present calls forth what is absent. Oh, I love that so much, Oren. On this paradoxical nature of gratitude, the writer and philosopher, yeah, and then you quote someone. So I want you to talk about gratitude and this paradoxical nature of it. This really spoke to me. Thank you. Yeah, it was one of the things that really pushed me in writing the book was to look more deeply at what is it to be grateful and what is the experience of gratitude in a world of so much suffering and there's a war raging you know across the ocean i don't i don't need to go through the list we you know we know the immensity of the pain whether it's from human violence or natural disaster or climate refugees so you know to be grateful in our lives when we are away to our times calls forth also the presence of the hardship and the suffering in our world and it, it can appear that these are in conflict, you know, that if I'm being grateful for the blessings in my life, I'm somehow ignoring or not attending to the pain and the suffering in the world. When in fact, gratitude opens the heart to all of life, it helps us to embrace what it is to be human, which as we were talking about earlier, includes grief and loss It's part of being here kind of woven into the fabric of our lives. So gratitude, I think, helps to broaden our view. We appreciate the goodness that's here. We have the resilience to include the pain in our own lives, the hardship and the suffering that's here and that's around us. But also as we work to alleviate suffering in whatever way we do that, whether it's helping a neighbor, volunteering, being politically active, donating, in whatever way we work to alleviate suffering, gratitude helps us stay balanced so that we don't overlook the goodness, so, so that we know, you know, there is beauty in life. There is tremendous kindness and generosity. It's not just the, the difficult and the ugly part of the human species. So they, it balances us. And it's so essential, I think, gratitude to sustain us when we're going through hard times, personally uh, or collectively. You know, many, many social movements for change sustain themselves through celebration. We look back at the, the civil rights movement here in the United States, and, you know, joy was an essential part of the movement, really celebrating the integrity of the vision and touching into that well of gratitude as a way of nourishing the heart for the long road. So for me, you know, I talk a little bit in the book about the heartache and the joy of the last year. I'm kind of moving between gratitude and joy here because I think both bear this, this similar paradoxical nature. You know, gratitude connects to grief and loss, joy connects to sorrow. Um, the joy of having a child and going through those changes as a family and witnessing his growth, and then and the gratitude for those blessings, and then the grief of losing my own father uh, and not having him present. And so as I 
you know, see these milestones in, in our son's life of seeing him walk or have his first, first birthday together with the gratitude for just bearing witness and the joy, there's also the absence. There's also that sense of my dad's not here to see this, to enjoy this. And so, you know, part of our work, I think, as human beings is how do we make our heart big enough to hold all of it? Oh, man, so powerful. I was walking today. And when I walk early in the morning, I always have I think to myself, I talk to myself, and, and sometimes I use the voice recorder to record something. It sounded so profound when I was saying it, and it's similar to the things that you were saying it, and maybe I was inspired by the book. I'm talking about loss, uh, because as I was walking, I was thinking, I was playing this melody that my father used to like, and I was crying, really. You know, I don't have both of my parents either, so I understand what when you say, you know, my parents also didn't see my child. You know, it's you go through this all the time. And I was thinking this morning, I'm like, wow, so many people I loved are not alive. And it's just, it was a realization. Obviously, I knew it, you know, like including my parents, my grandparents, lovely neighbors, people who influenced me in my life, teachers, friends, schoolmates, you know, because of my life. It's like, wow, so many people are not alive. And so I was reflecting on that as I was walking and I said this to myself, I recorded it. I thought it was profound. Like, let me see if I can play it, if you can hear it. Loss has made me stronger, not weaker. With each loss, my heart can do more. And I will change and confess more. And so my empathy grows for others and my compassion towards other beings. It grows with my own. It's a grill. I guess a experience. You might need to repeat yes, it. Yes, I, I can't, I can't quite yeah, you, make it you out. Can't, I have to make it out. So this, I can include that in the audio, but basically it says the loss that I have experienced has made my heart bigger, like a big container, so it can contain happiness and joy and wonder. Because of the loss and pain that I have experienced many times, I feel like my heart is bigger and it can contain more, more grief, more loss, more gratitude, more happiness, and more empathy for others. Basically, that's the takeaway. Precisely. Precisely, right? It's, it's so wonderful to hear that connection. Yeah. So uh, the last thing I'm going to ask you is is joy. So we want to end uh, on a different note. And you already started speaking about it. And there was something I highlighted in the joy section of the book. How much joy do we miss in life because we are moving too quickly? That's so true. So true. So talk to me about joy. How can we <laughs> be more present not to miss the joyous moment in our moments in our lives? And how can we cultivate more joy and seek more joy and even give permission to ourselves to invite joy, regardless of the problems and the grief and the pain and the war, because everything can coexist together, right? It's not either this or that. You're not a bad person to be joyous if there is work going on in the world, right? No, no. And and in fact, you know, one of the arguments I make in the book is that we actually need joy in order to stay open to the hardships in the world. Like if we don't have any joy, we're not even keeping our, our own head above water. So how can we be there for anyone else? It's exactly what you said. It's both can be true and coexist. And I think it goes even a step further is that the joy actually enables us to be more, more responsible citizens and to stay alert to what's needed. So talk to us about joy. I mean, we need joy. Human beings need joy, just like a plant <laughs> needs light and water and air. If we don't have joy, our life becomes kind of dead inside, sort of lat. This is biological. You know, we if you look at other mammals, you'll see, you know, they experience emotions. We share that limbic brain. And uh, so when we are, when our basic needs are met, and this is one of the themes I come back to again and again in the book is how essential it is to feel physically and psychologically safe in order to cultivate many of these qualities like joy and play and how 
we can be deprived of access to some of this richness through, you know, the violence of poverty, other ways that our society is, is structured. To feel joy, to start to really open to it, we have to be willing to be touched by life, which means that we have to be open to receiving. So I encourage people to start small is one of the core sort of principles that runs through the book, you know, and to just notice. And here again, we see like the attention, you know, what are we paying attention to, to notice and enjoy small moments of beauty, of goodness in our lives, you know, the birds, flock of birds flying overhead or feeling the breeze on your face as you step outside or one of my favorite <laughs> moments every day, the first sip of coffee, you know, and just really being there for the heat and the aroma and the flavor. So when we slow down and start to let ourselves take in the beauty and the richness of being alive, that nourishes joy. And I cite my colleague, Rick Hansen, and his practice. Uh, I'm sure you've shared on the podcast in different ways, uh, if not. He's by... been, yes, he's been a guest twice. Yeah. So, yes. Great. Yeah, exactly. You know, the practice of taking in the good, right? Of noticing and then lingering there. I also like to point out that particularly for those who have some kind of meditation connection or religious or spiritual practice, that there are pitfalls or sort of misunderstandings about joy and contemplative practice. And I, I think one kind of conflates inner healing and uh, contemplative practice with feeling good. It's about feeling calm and peaceful. We see this narrative a lot in popular secular mindfulness. Um, so it's all about the joy, the happiness, the bliss, the good feeling. And the strength there, of course, is that there's a celebration of the joy and the happiness in life and a, a real welcoming of it. The danger is that it leads us to avoiding anything that's difficult or heavy or painful or trying to put a spin on everything, which limits our capacity to really be fully alive because we're disconnecting from at least half of what we experience. The other side of it, which tends to afflict Buddhists the most because of the way it gets taught, is Buddhists and Catholics, perhaps, which is that we associate religion and spirituality with suffering and seriousness. And then we feel afraid of pleasure. We feel afraid of joy. So we start to disengage or pull away from it. We worry that, you know, it'll stir up craving or we'll be sinful or it'll lead to attachment. And that actually starts to cut us off from the other half of life. We start to suppress or avoid anything that feels good. And, you know, any of these kind of craft of the heart, whether it's poetry or music or art or meditation, these really are inviting us to be in relationship with all of life to open to the joy and the sorrow, to welcome that which is easeful and that which is difficult. And so joy really lets us strengthen our capacity inside so that we have the resilience to be fully human and open to all that's present. Well, so beautiful. Reminds me of that documentary, uh, Mission Joy, with Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Have you seen that? I haven't, but I'm familiar with their book on joy, which is such a beautiful, beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I highly recommend that. I think it's available now on Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. I know it's available now. I encourage people to watch it and you can see that there are differences in how they, yeah, it's a wonderful movie, documentary. Anyways, I don't want to comment. Well, thank you so much, Oren. Where can the listeners find you? <laughs> That's the next uh, boring question. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first, thank you, Anna, for this wonderful podcast and for your time and for inviting me on. It's been a real pleasure to reconnect. And thank you for sharing my book with folks. So if people want to learn more, the book is available anywhere books are sold. Um, my website is probably the best place to learn more about my work, orinjsofer.com. And I have a newsletter. I send out one or two emails a month with a, a reflection or a teaching. And I'm also on social media at orinjsofer. I know. I, I follow you on Instagram. Is there anything else uh, that you want to say, a message or something that I didn't ask that, uh, or something, a comment that is left over from this conversation? Just really the encouragement that the future is not written for any of us personally or collectively. It's shaped by what we think, say, and do today. And so, you know, 
whether it's through my book, your podcast, or other resources, just my wholehearted encouragement to connect with what's possible. You mentioned at the beginning of our conversation something that I said in our last interview, which was what's available for me in this relationship. And so maybe to end, I would just offer that back to listeners in a broader way and to just invite what's available in this life. And I think that's a question that's onward leading for us to really be open to the possibility of fulfilling our potential and living a life that is rich and meaningful and connected to something larger than ourselves. Yeah. If you have two minutes, I can play uh, your own words back to you. I have it on my screen. I can share my screen and play if you want to listen to it. Um, let me do that. I think it's worth listening. It's really powerful. What's challenging about this is there's a very important difference between genuine letting go and shutting down or avoiding. And it's a really subtle difference with the shutting down or avoiding. There's sort of a resignation. There's a quality of like, well, I give up, forget it, where it's not actually a true sense of acceptance, which when it is true letting go, there's a peacefulness and there's nothing left. There's no barrier. There's no resentment. There's no hurt. It's like we see the truth of the situation, which is in this relationship, this is what's available. And Either this isn't available or I'm consciously choosing to not continue to put energy to try to get that need met here. And when that choice is conscious and wholehearted and the letting go is complete, it ceases to be a barrier. Oh, so, yeah, that was number one. Uh, very powerful. And let's hear the second one. You know, letting go happens. It's not something that we can do. Any will to let go actually complicates the the process and is another kind of control or contraction. It would probably be more accurate to say letting be. We let things be with a sense of, of kindness and tenderness and patience. And then in its own time, the heart lets go because the heart sees and knows eventually when the conditions are right, our heart will understand holding on here hurts. And it senses the freedom, the spaciousness of allowing things to be the way they are. Mm, so good. So <laughs> good. Or <laughs> what do you think now that you heard them? <laughs> Any commentary? I, you know, these things don't belong to us. It's so true. It's true. It's beautiful. And I'm touched that, you know, you saved those moments and shared them with others. And it's, uh, I just feel grateful to have been exposed to teachers and practices who helped me to understand those things in such a way that I could share them with others. It's not mine, you know, so I, I'm just grateful to be able to pass on what I've learned. Mm, perfect answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I so appreciate your presence, your book, your sharing, your wisdom, the way you speak, the words that you choose. Really a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. Me too. It's great to see you, Anna. 